And welcome everybody to tonight's call. This is Chef AJ and you're listening to Healthy Living with Chef AJ. My guest tonight is Ray Cronice. During his 15 years at NASA, Ray worked on a microgravity, material science, biophysics, physical and analytical chemistry and space station environmental control and life support systems. Say that 10 times fast. Today, Ray is changing the way the medical community views the human body's nutritional and caloric energy balance by driving unprecedented weight loss through basic thermodynamic principles. It's funny because up until about a month ago, I honestly did not know Ray. And what happened is when we had our weekly teleclass with Dr. Michael Clapper, he was citing Ray and his wonderful research. And then in the case of serendipity, Ray actually contacted me by email and I asked him to be on the teleclass. So thank you so much for being here, Ray. Thank you for having me. Yeah. You know, I I love your TED Med. Uh, It was, it was, I mean, just, just hearing that eating 16 M&Ms more a week can make somebody fat was just that, that, that's it. That's nothing. 16 M&Ms. Yeah. It's, it's really impossible to guess calories. I mean, humans are amazing machines. We're, we're amazing bio machines and, and we're, we're adapted to survive. And if you think about the environment we live in, it goes from, having lots of energy and lots of food at certain times of the year, so to say the peak of the summer, to having almost none. And, the you know, this little machine is, is perfectly designed uh, to, to do that. But today we really don't have that kind of variation uh, in our life. Yeah, it's amazing because, you know, when, when, when you think about it, some people won't even skip breakfast. And like you said, our ancestors, they went long times without any food. Exactly. So, you know, in, in, if we talk about this at the highest level, if you think of in, in the paper that we have out that came out in June, the metabolic winter hypothesis, you know, the idea is, you know, if we think about metabolic winter as a time when it's dark, it's cool, we're still because we're trying to conserve en- energy and, and food is scarce. And then, you, you know, may, maybe you go to the opposite side, the opposite season, the mid, beginning of the summer, the, or in the middle of the summer, we're talking about something that's bright and warm and active and food is abundant. But if you think about what's happened in the last 100 years, we've essentially eradicated uh, metabolic winter from our lives. In other words, you know, it's always light, it's always warm, and it's always, you know, food is always abundant. <laughs> but the I like it. We have- <laughs> Ray, but- I like that way. <laughs> I we all do and we all like sugar and we all like fat. We all I, like all kinds of things, but just because we like them doesn't necessarily mean they're good in excess. I, I was being a little bit facetious, but I but I, I hear you. And your paper it was an excellent paper and we gave our listeners the link to it, the, the metabolic hypothesis, a cause of the current epidemic of obesity and car- cardiometabolic disease. What, where did that appear, this, uh, this wonderful article? That, that was in the uh, Journal of, um, gosh, now I just forgot, the, the journal, journal of uh, Metabolic Syndrome and Related yeah. Disorders. So it's mainly, uh, it's a journal geared towards endocrinologists. And mm-hmm. one of the things we were trying to do, in fact, that's one of the things with uh, Dr. Clapper that he and I spent a lot of time when, uh, when I was just doing a self-experiment that you were talking about. And I was out there for two weeks doing one of their medically supervised fasts. And, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is get people to really stop and think about this whole problem again. If you you can imagine over the last 200 years, we've learned a lot about the human body. But some things that are really important in a lot of testing, a lot of things we did even 100 years ago, fasting, since you're familiar with that, going to True North, and you understand how much we really know about fasting – but, you know, some of the stuff is covered in maybe a couple paragraphs in a modern textbook. It's not that it's unimportant, but it's not the focus anymore because we, we long ago understood it, and yet we don't go back and look at all the data and all the things we do. So anybody who's visited True North and gone through that or watched some of the things that happened uh, during that process, uh, it, it's really amazing, but we, we just don't look in this. And, and that's really what metabolic winter is about. It's about a time when – we do give our bodies a chance to regenerate, to do things that are helpful. Mm. You know, it's funny because um, until I went to True North and I saw people actually going without food for 42 days, and these were not obese people. These were people with medical conditions that were actually quite thin. It would never dawn on me that something like that would even be possible. Somebody who, you know, I'm Jewish. I've never even fasted a day on Yom Kippur. And to see people go six weeks without food was, it was at first bizarre. And then I, I couldn't believe it, you know? Right, and and I had never been more than about 
four, I think four days had been the max before that time, but um, certainly had not uh, uh, not been two weeks without food. And and I didn't know what to expect, but going into this, the 30 days before this, the whole experiment was I basically lost 30 pounds in six weeks. Uh, and I measured my, you know, about 80 biomarkers. I measured my metabolism. I, I had a continuous glucose monitor. So I actually went from a from essentially – pre-diabetic because I, I trend towards type 2 diabetes, although I fixed that with diet, you know, four or five years ago. If I eat bad food, I can bring it back in, in about 12 weeks. So mm. I went from that point, I watched my diabetes, my, my watched my blood sugar go from out of control, I mean, highs in the, in, in the 200s, all the way back to perfect control with, a, with a, an implant, a glucose monitor implant, and then the calorimetry. And what was really amazing is, is that you know, when you talked about people, you know, thinking, oh, my gosh, if we skip breakfast, you know, if we break fast, I mean, obviously, <laughs> the first meal of any day is technically break fast. But right. anyway, if somehow we skip this early morning meal, that we're going to go into starvation mode. And that part is actually true, but it doesn't mean that your metabolism is going to shut down. In fact, it's it, it it's so obvious what the answer here is. It's it's amazing that this story gets propagated over and over because starvation mode means your body burns fat. It doesn't go straight for the kidney. It doesn't go straight for the heart. It doesn't go straight for the calf muscle or the toe muscle or the eyeball. It burns fat because that's why we have fat for times when there aren't any food. I mean, this is obvious, and yet you actually have to debate this with really smart people sometimes. <laughs> You have to debate this idea that your body isn't going to suddenly, you know, you know, turn into a jellyfish. Right. You know, it's interesting because you say about burn fat because a lot of people, I, you know, I run a, a weight loss program in Los Angeles and people want to lose weight. But really what they want to do is lose fat because, you know, you don't want right. to lose your bone or your, your, you know, your muscle. You want to lose fat. So what brought you to True North? And would you mind talking a little bit about the experiment you did there that Dr. Clapper was actually referring to in the call when uh, someone had asked him about the benefits of intermittent fasting? Right. So. It, it turns out that, uh, that Dr. Clapper is the reason I went. Um, I saw him originally at one of uh, Dr. McDougall's advanced study weekends, and he had spoken. I was really impressed, and we spoke, and he, we share a, an aviation bug. Obviously, I, before I did this, I, I was in this space with my thing, and we started a company called Zero G that does the weightless flights, and he knew about that, and we had a lot of conversation. But um, as I was doing some of these experiments, he kept encouraging me and said, you know, we, you know, we there's so much stuff that we really need to learn about fasting. I mean, we know a lot, but it's just there's there's so much to. You might want to consider looking at that too, especially how it combines with cold, because I was I was doing a lot of the cold research at the time, and and so you know if you think about it, you know if you think about the idea that you know everybody wants to know calories in, calories out, but most of the calories leave our body as waste heat. We don't mm -hmm. think about that, but that is you know. A car, an air conditioner, a, a motor, they're all about 80% or about 20% efficient. So most of the of fuel you put in your gas and in, or, or fuel you put in your car leaves your car as waste, waste heat. It's the engine getting hot. It's the exhaust getting hot. So it, it leaves as waste heat. Only about 20% moves you forward. And the same thing goes for the human body. So as we were talking about this, you know, he, he encouraged me, and, and, and I started thinking about this idea of, your metabolism crashing. I'm thinking to myself, okay, is nutrition really an emergency? I mean, people want me to eat all the time. And in our paper, one of the things we hypothesize is the fact that now we're chronically fed. We're always eating all the time, seeking nutrients. We need vitamin C. We need vitamin D. We need B12. We need protein. We need all these things that we supposedly need. And yet, you know, do we really need to eat three times a day? Did they shut down the pyramids, you know, three, five, five times a day to feed those guys? Yes, probably exactly. not. Exactly. They probably gave them some water and said, you know, chip some rocks. We got pyramids to build, right? So, right. and then then threw them bread, you know, and and I don't, I don't think they all died of gluten. They they basically threw them some bread <laughs> and they probably did fine, did, you know, did their thing. But my point is, is that we have so mechanized food in a reductionist way. I think he mentioned Colin Campbell in, in his book, Whole. He talks about reductionism, and it's not that we don't need to know these things or that some of these things aren't important. It's just I don't believe we need to know it. We don't need to plan a meal around it. You know, mm -hmm. it's pretty easy. So back to, to him inviting me, the idea was, you know, if nutrition is an emergency, then surely to goodness, two weeks, 
of water would cause me an issue. Now, I knew the end of the story. I knew that it didn't matter because, as you said, a little bit of research, you find that people fast 20, 30, 40 days. I was a lightweight at 14 days. People were like, oh, my gosh, you didn't eat for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, you know, the truth of the matter is most of those people there were not eating for 25 to 40 days. They had serious medical conditions. I was just fat, you know, so I didn't have a problem. You know, I just had to lose some of that body fat you were talking about. So my point is, is that um, the idea was to look at that. And so what we, what I looked at specifically was watching, looking at what happened to my metabolism. Mm -hmm. And even though my weight dropped every day, my metabolism went down ever so slightly. If you go to my blog, there's actually a plot that I did, um, a preliminary plot that I did. But every single day from day one of my you know, of when the diet began on October 11th until when it ended on November 22nd, every single day, my fat burn went up. I was burning more and more percentage of fat. And I was measuring it, you know, literally breath by breath with a calorimeter. So, uh, and calibrated. So I, I know that it's true. I know that it's right. And it makes sense, right? I mean, your body burns fat when you don't have any food. That's not, this isn't rocket science, you know, yeah. but it's not what I believed before. I right. believed all the same things. So I, when I say this, I don't want to sound like I'm just sort of you know, casting dispersion on everybody and saying no one knows this. I said all these same things, and here's the big difference. I was a repeater. I repeated, I repeated, I repeated. I'd read and repeat, and read and repeat, and read and repeat. And that's a, millions of words out on, on blogs every day is read and repeat. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we understand what we read, and sometimes we don't. But the point is we have to actually measure too. And it turns out it doesn't take much measuring to prove that your metabolism doesn't really crash. And yet it's said every single day. I mean, you always hear it. Everyone thinks they're broken. Everyone thinks. And I don't think people are broken. I have not met a person with a broken metabolism yet. And for everybody listening, here's the deal. Look at your weight and look at the weight of the person to the left and the right of you. Mm -hmm. If their weight is more than you, their metabolism, metabolism is bigger than yours. Mm -hmm. If their weight is less than you, their metabolism is lower than yours. And that's the truth. And, and I, I challenge anybody to find the difference there. The fact is your metabolism scales with your weight, not mm -hmm. with lean body mass, with weight, with how mm -hmm. much you weigh. And, and so – being able to bring that together with that staff, with Dr. Clapper, with Dr. Goldhammer, and all of the people that were there, all the interns, everybody, it was really fun to see it as results. I mean, real time, every single day, you know, my metabolism wasn't, wasn't changing. That, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with a documentary that I once saw, and, and I, I'll try to find it for you if you haven't seen it, but it was from the BBC, and it was called Why Thin People Can't Get Fat. And what I they know did, exactly. You saw it, right? Wasn't it incredible? I did. That was incredible because what they did is they force-fed these thin young people. I believe they were in their 20s, and there was something like 20 people in the experiment, 10,000 calories a day, and after 30 days, none of them gained any weight. Right, and it all it all left as waste heat. Mm -hmm. But but if they continue to do it, yeah, eventually they would end up with some dysfunction. Eventually they would start gaining weight too. Mm -hmm. And so, the but the point is, it's not because people necessarily have broken metabolism. That's not the issue. But you know, having a diagnosis gives you certainty. Having a diagnosis really kind of says it's not my fault. And I'm not saying this in a in, in the fact that any of us, when I was 80 pounds overweight, this is not about value or self-worth. I'm just talking science here. I'm just mm -hmm. talking about the, that part. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that, is that it, it sometimes feeling like you're broken might actually feel better because then you say, oh, my gosh, you know, it's, it's not something I can do or change. But the other side of it is as soon as you change your diet, I mean, how many people you've worked with have changed their diet and miraculously – they get healthy and they get thin and they, and the, and the situations go away. I mean, I tell people every day, if you were only drinking water, do you think you would plateau? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and exactly how do you expect that would happen? And, and it doesn't happen. And we all know this makes sense. The real question is why do we continue to overeat? You know, why do we do that? And that's, I think gets back to another part that's in our paper, which is, you know, food is mostly 
social with human beings. In fact, we conclude in our paper, you know, the only species that are obese and chronically ill are us and the animals, the pets. We keep yeah, warm and fed. Exactly. And they get exactly the same diseases. They get little doggy diabetes, little doggy heart disease, right. little doggy arthritis. And think about it for a second, you know, and, and I know there's some people that it might make upset, but your doggy doesn't love you in the way that you may love your husband or wife. Mm-hmm. Your doggy loves you because you feed them and they are socialized with you. But yeah. they're only socialized with you because of food. You know, you stop feeding them, they're not probably going to hang around too long. <laughs> so, and some of your friends are the same way. The yeah. fact of the matter is we don't know how to get together as human beings. Without eating. You, you know, Without this, eating. This is so interesting that you said that, Ray, because, well, first of all, one of the things you said, I heard Dr. Doug Lyle say at True North, that of the millions of species, the only three that have ever been overweight in the history of the world are humans, domesticated dogs, and domesticated cats. And I think the social thing is part of it, but I also think those are the only three species that ever eat processed food. Nowhere else in nature do you have any other species eating processed food. But the social aspect is of particular importance to me because I, my, I don't like the word resolution, but my goal for 2015 was to never eat in a restaurant unless I'm actually lecturing out of the country and that's my only choice because I, I have a problem with that too that, that it seems that unless you're eating people don't want to be your friend it's like why can't we go for a hike or to the theater or to a movie or to yoga everything centers around food and I'm frankly tired of it right and and, and think about this I, I was talking to a friend earlier this morning you know he uh, he actually turned 40 yesterday, and I called him up to wish him a happy birthday, and we were talking about this exact issue. And one of the things he commented, he was talking about uh, you know, a big event happening at their home with 80 people and all these people coming over to eat, and they were worried about whether they were going to eat at 4 or whether they were going to eat at 6 o'clock, and what would they do two hours without food? And, of course, he was laughing about this. He said, you know, think about it. If, if, we, if, we, if you imagine – um, I was asking him, if you imagine inviting the couple that you guys always like to, to eat with and bring them over to the home and just don't eat, don't have food, don't have anything to drink. Unless someone's thirsty, you can get them something to drink, but just get sure. together and do whatever you do normally because it's not chew. That's not why you got together. Yeah. So if you got together and do this, and I'm not against eating socially. I'm, this is really a thought experiment, so I don't want people to think that I'm against people getting together to eat. It's not that extreme. I'm saying as a thought experiment – Imagine you get together with the people that are closest to you, the people that you want to do, who you want to, you know, to be with. And what do you do if you don't eat? Right. And the truth of the matter is, is that, is that is you do the normal thing. You do what we're doing right now. Imagine this phone call couldn't have happened unless you sent out an email to every single person out there and all of us had something to eat first before we did what we're really here to do, which is to talk about food, which is okay. You can talk about food and not eat it. I watched Chef Bravo cooking three times, a, you know, two times a week and all the other great chefs there and went to food demos and I was drinking water. Was my mouth watering? Absolutely. Did that food smell good? amazing. Was I miserable? Not at all. I was not miserable at all. We talked about food and I was really motivated to fix that food when I got home. (laughs) Do you see what I mean by that that thought experiment? The idea of when we get together, even at a restaurant, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You get together at a business lunch and you sit down with people and there's a little bit about the menu what are you going to order? I don't know. What are you going to order? We're going to advertise. Are we going to get a drink? Here's a drink. Everything comes. You get your order. Then your food comes. How does yours taste? How does mine taste? How does yours taste? What does this taste like? Did you get this or you get that? Then the conversation switches. It's no longer about food. It's why you got together, right? Mm-hmm. So that goes on until maybe the dessert, and then there's the check. But the point is the reason you got together was to do something other than chew. You got right. together to communicate. And one of my clients that I worked with, and she really brought this to the forefront. She said, you know, the family meal, if you think about it, in her case, she doesn't have a family yet. She said, you know, I don't think I ever want to have family meals because I don't think I want I, – she had been obese her whole life, and mm-hmm. now she's not. And she said, you know, I don't know that I want to teach my kids if I decide to have kids. I don't know if I want to teach them to sit down on the table, and that's the time to communicate. I think yeah. we'd rather just sit in the, in, the, in the living room and communicate and just get food over. Maybe standing at the kitchen counter is a better thing, not all the time, but the fact that every single day 
every single break. I mean, think about it. We're a society of one meal that takes breaks mm-hmm. to sleep and work. Everything mm-hmm. else is a meal. Every break, every pause, every right. time you go get with somebody, even when you go to the gas station. Food okay. at the gas station. All right. You yeah, start you know, putting gas in your car. You're, you're bringing up so many things that I agree with and I talk about all the time because I could almost argue that a gas station should have apples and bananas because you're driving from here to there. Maybe you need a snack. But how come when I go to Petco to buy my dog a leash, there's candy at the dog store? How come when I go to the hardware store to buy a hammer, there's candy at the register? This is what I don't understand. And I think partly it's mostly in this country because, Ray, I have, a, I have clients in other countries like, like, like France, and it doesn't seem seem to be as um, this way in other countries. Like in the, I remember when I went to high school, if I was chewing gum or if I had a snack, I would get sent to the principal's office. You weren't allowed to eat at your desk. But the minute I got to college, I mean, you could have a buffet. The teachers didn't care. You could bring in a whole pizza and a soda. And in and, and meetings in the United States, you can't have a meeting of any kind without there being donuts or a soccer game. without the, and, and it's not even healthy food. I could understand if it was, you know, water or some fruit or some salad. But it doesn't seem to be so much in other countries that way. You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, my daughter and I, we, we spent three weeks in Germany uh, two years ago, and I'm, I'm seeing all the same things there. I don't mm-hmm. I think this is just a fundamental human issue. And, wow. you know, and I'll add to your list of cats, dogs, every zoo yeah. animals have the same problem. Sure. So it actually transcends to every species that, that's in captivity. They have yeah. issues with sure. food there. And and I'll also say that I'll even I want to disrupt just again for the thought you know it's that pause I'll even talk about healthy snacks the idea that you always have to put something in your mouth if 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 eating if not eating for two weeks is okay yeah then surely going from New York City to L A you don't have to stuff your face with peanuts and drink Coke I'm not saying it's right. bad or you shouldn't right. ever do it I'm saying we entertain ourselves with food and food yeah. entertainment, and I'm, and I'm not against entertaining ourselves with food. Yeah. I'm just simply saying from a very strict biological perspective, food is not entertainment. It's life. And right. so I can even take your title process and say just twist that just a little bit and say you know, that becomes another thing that people talk about. Is it processed or unprocessed? And I'm just saying – all of it, even healthful food, if right. you're eating all the time, sure, you end up setting up these patterns and you send up these things that could cause an issue. And, that, and that's yeah. important. So when we know that we're without food, even if it's helpful, for, when, we're, when, we're, when we're without food in metabolic winter or in the case of True North when we're fasting, we absolutely know that a series of metabolic processes start, start up that actually help our health. So, for mm-hmm. example, in our paper, we talk about one, my, one of my collaborators, David Sinclair. He was you know, this year's Time Magazine, 100 Most Influential uh, People, and he is the guy behind resveratrol. Everybody knows about resveratrol and red mm-hmm. wine, although we don't have to drink tea. He would tell you we don't have to drink red wine to do it, but these, these compounds, these, uh, these compounds are, are activate these genes called the sirtuins, and there are seven sirtuin genes, and they're conserved in all species, so they're not just in humans. They're in yeast cells. They're in plant cells. They're in mice. They're in, 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 in all mammals. And so the point what we find is that in all animals and all actually all cells, all the way down to yeast, when we restrict calories by 30 or so 40% of ad libitum feeding, and what I mean by that is not social eating feeding, not how much you're eating now, but how much you really need, how much a squirrel really eats in your backyard, how much a bird really eats. You know, they eat until they're full, and then they stop. So if you restrict their cal- calories by 30 to 40 percent, they live 40 to 50 percent longer because they wow. don't get these degenerative diseases we're talking about. These, these genes are protective. They start doing housekeeping in the, at the cellular level and slow down the whole aging process. But what's really interesting about that is that is that it, it works for all of these species. And what we, if we think about it, every year in winter, we did a little caloric restriction. Mm-hmm. And in some sense, the plant-based diet that you and I eat is a natural form of caloric restriction, but even that gets adulterated by the stuff that now will put your processed word back in, gets adulterated mm-hmm. by the sugar, gets adulterated by the salt, gets adulterated by the oil, gets adulterated right. by things that 
cause us to want to eat more. It's not that any one of these things is poison or kill you, you know? Right. And, 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 you know, there's really, unless you take up a liking for, you know, for hemlock tea, one serving of anything is probably not going to be a problem. The, the problem is, is when it happens chronically. Right. And, and we're really good at acute medicine. We know how to treat things. You get a you know, piece of steel to <laughs> your head, they can probably yeah. fix you. Yeah. That, that's the problem funny. is, go ahead. No, no I was going to say, you just said we're really good at acute medicine. I actually ruptured a tendon today, and I just literally made it on the call. But like you said, I, you know, when this happened, I didn't ask for a kale smoothie. I went you know, to the emergency room to get my, 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 my hand fixed. But you're right, we're, we're terrible at treating chronic diseases. Right, and the reason why is because the feedback loop is so so far. So you know, you're, you're, when your child is near the fireplace and you say, "Don't get there," and they touch something and they burn their finger, hey, that's real quick. I know I shouldn't do that, mm -hmm. but the kind of diseases we have, the kinds of diseases that travel, you know, remember obesity doesn't cause disease; it's a symptom. Okay, mm -hmm. so. If you're overweight, you probably have some other things that are happening. But the kinds of things like diabetes and heart disease and, you know, and arthritis and the autoimmune diseases that are out there, these are things that are potentially all happening because of chronic exposure, chronic overnutrition. So one of the things we, we propose in our, in, in, in our paper is this idea that if you're chronically overnourished, if you're constantly in that place where you, you, you and I both, we, I was just in Australia and it was summer there. I love summer just like you. Yeah. But if we're constantly in bright and active and warm uh, and, and abundant, you know, and warm, you know, we might – cause these issues, not next year, not five years, but a decade or two or three later. And because the feedback is so slow and the attention span is 140 characters, it's not surprising that we all get tripped up by this. I was 80 pounds overweight and I used to be doing, I used to do protein synthesis. I had no idea what a protein was, even though I used to synthesize them. And what <laughs> I mean by that, I knew the biochemical side of it. I understood the biochemistry, understood how to do cytogenic mutagenesis and how to synthesize and why these proteins were folding the way they are. But I didn't know what protein was in a bigger, more you know, food sense, more biological sense. And so, you know, one of the tests we did while I was at True North is on the seventh day of my fast, we took my blood every four hours and did a complete amino acid profile. And guess what? My, my amino acids changed all day long because they're on a circadian clock just like my sleep pattern is. That is so and interesting. And that's after no food for two weeks. And people are saying, where do you get your protein? You know, I, mean, I know we all, everybody probably on this call doesn't laugh at that question, especially right. if they've heard uh, Dr. Lyle speak. You know, he does right. it. He, he does that. You know, I don't know. I love, I love that talk. But the point <laughs> is, is that it changed even when I was fasting. And that is my body is generating what it needs, et cetera. Incidentally, uh, for the other one, everybody talks about B12. Oh, my gosh, how are you going to get B12? My B12 tripled during my fast. Wow. So will I imagine be, it was sort of – Will you be writing anything about your stay at True North, either in a paper or just a blog post? I'm probably, I'm probably going to – if there's enough interest, I'm going to write a book. I don't I, – I've been writing it. I don't want to write a diet book, but I really want to write an interesting story about food. And so what yeah. I've spent the last five years doing – is going through about 200 textbooks and 11,000 papers to try to figure out why it is we ended up this way. Well, I would and it's love a really an interesting story. I'd love for you to write a book because just just I mean everything you're saying is just like I'm I'm just like fascinated because I love learning things that I didn't know before. You know, when you were, you were on the TED Med talk that we sent out to everybody, you had mentioned you had tried all the diets and all the diets work. And it's absolutely true because every diet works. The problem is is that people go off the diet that caused them to lose weight. But I was curious when you said even yours Dean, were you referring to Dean Ornish by any chance? Dean Ornish was the person. That's right. Okay. You know, and that, Ornish, that, he was the reason I, I changed my diet. We were out speaking one that not that evening, but a year earlier, we were at we were out speaking uh, at a at at a, at a conference. I still had at that point. I still had the reactive hypoglycemia, where I was literally passing out, terrifying my kids in the car. Um, I had high fasting blood sugars. I had high A one Cs, and I had cut out everything but fish, eggs and dairy at that point. I was a yogurt 
Uh, I, I love yogurt. I still do, <laughs> but I don't <laughs> eat it, but I love it. So the point is I cut everything but those out of my diet. And um, he just said, hey, Ray, why don't you try doing that for, for just three months? And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm sort of extreme that way. I thought, you know, I'm just going to do this for a year. So I started um, Thanksgiving week uh, 2009, so that was actually before Thanksgiving, not after, like everybody else. Mm-hmm. And by February or March uh, of 2010, all of my problems were gone. They were all gone. Wow. And so I continued that whole year, uh, in fact, even till February. So um, there, there are really no animal products in my diet at all until all, over a year. And e- even now, it's, it's very rare for me I just because I feel so much better. Sure. But, um, but, but the point, yeah, you, you know, he, he was one of those people. And, and they do work. And if you look in the paper, one of the things you'll see – is the food triangle. And so one of the, one of the things I would love to do uh, sort of, this would be like a history mystery with me doing crazy stuff. You know, I'm just Forrest Gump down here in Alabama doing silly things. I don't know why in the world when I measure my metabolism, it never goes down, but everybody else says that I'm going to go into starvation mode and I can't figure that out. And just sort of tell that history mystery. If, if that is something I think people would be interested in, you know, it's, it's, I just feel like everyone's tired of the contradictions, and I know that I can answer those contradictions in a non-ideological way. If you look at the food triangle in the paper, it'll be really easy to see that you know a vegan diet is, is sort of on the right-hand side of the food triangle, and a paleo diet, you know, which is sort of all the rage with people, is on the left-hand side. Okay, and there's different health methods there, but you can control your weight on either side. You know. I think something – I think a different one is healthy, but it's really – that's not the point. What's not on the food triangle is there's no sugar. There's no, there's no refined oil. There's yeah. no refined grains on there. It's just whole foods. Mm-hmm. And if you stay on one side of it or the other, then you're, then you're fine. But as soon as you add both sides, you know, you add those things together, you're going you're gonna to end up having problem with weight, and it happens very predictably because you end up eating way too much food. This is the energy density lectures that you've that you've seen. So, sure, um, and I actually you know, got I, I actually give one, and it's like Dr. McDougall has been saying for 40 years: it's the food. It's the food, absolutely. Right. I mean, I, I he he was it was it was so great. Uh, to spend the time, you know, I, for about a year, year, a little over a year, I went to uh, every one of his events, uh, stay weekends, and met some really amazing people and listened. Were and it you was there, just so neat. Were you there the year that I, I, I appeared? I, I spoke there in February of 2011. Were you there the year that I spoke? Perhaps, but I can't remember. You I could can't have remember if you never. were there. I, I, I really can't I really can't remember if, if you were there during the time I was. I know that Lindsay Nixon was there because that's when she and I met. Okay. And, and and but I'm not I'm not That's sure funny. that you want do you want to hear something funny? So. Lindsay's coming for dinner tonight right after we get off the phone. Well great. Yeah. <laughs> so I said hello. Her. Ask her about yeah, her weight loss. I will, but I, I but I'm gonna tell her I can't talk to her because eating can't be social anymore, so I'm gonna tell her that. No, I'm no, just, I don't think I'm, that I'm, I'm, that I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> Unfortunately we can't see each other, but I'm kidding. But you probably weren't there because you would remember me if, if you saw me because I sing and you, you would remember that. I know you, you I didn't hear you sing. So okay, it so may have been one of the ones I missed. Oh darn. Well um how did how did your work lead to you being in Tim Ferriss's book, The Four Hour Body? So Tim and I had a, a, another mutual friend, a guy by the name of Joe Polish, and um, we had met earlier, and uh, Tim was at an interview when Bill Phillips interviewed me. So my first, you know, one of my failed attempts of, at weight loss, and I say failed because I regained, um, I used Bill Phillips' body for life. You know, it's the six small frequent meals a day and exercise every single day, six days a week. Um, and I had lost a lot of weight, and Joe and I were friends, and, and Bill – wanted to interview me during one of his events, and Tim and I met then. And then, you know, and I lost some of my weight, but not all of it. And then I guess a few years later, he saw me at, uh, at the Singularity University. If you're familiar with that, he saw me at Singularity University. He, he looked at me and said, dude, you've lost so much weight. What happened? And I said, you're not going to believe it. I did this cold stuff. And at the time, I wasn't trying to study anything. I was just trying to lose weight. I was just whatever I could do to do it. And that's what I was doing was the, the cold. 
He says, I'm writing a book. And he asked me if I could keep a secret. I'm writing a book, and he wanted to tell my story. And I said, let's do it. So I hadn't had – I didn't really intend to do what I was doing. And truthfully, I don't – if he hadn't written the book, people probably wouldn't have challenged me. And when they threw down the gauntlet and challenged me and told me that what I was saying was wrong, you know, at that point they actually sort of implied that you know, I was making this stuff up. Then that's when I really started looking at the calories, and that's when this stuff all started coming together. And so I ended up with this series of papers that are coming out because, right. because of Tim indirectly. Well, I love I've I've read them, and one of the things I wanna I wanna read just an excerpt from one of them, but I wanna go back to something you said a few minutes ago about how people can't fly from L.A. to New York or vice versa without having peanuts and a coke. I, I fly all the time, and just going from where I live in Los Angeles to the Bay Area, it's about a fifty minute flight, and people can't even go that far without an alcoholic beverage, even if it's nine o'clock in the morning. And you wrote in one of the papers that not everything we crave is necessarily what we need. Alcoholics and heroin addicts are just two examples of this change from have to have not that inserts a craving that is neither healthy or natural. We see it's the sudden change that seems to rock the boat and contrast showers are one way to not only mute your response to that change, but further to begin an easy, comfortable adaptation to lower cold temperatures ahead. I think a lot of people might not be familiar with what, this, what you're talking about here, the cold stress. Would you t tell us a little bit about what you're talking about so that in layman's terms, so that people can understand what you're, what you're going for. Right. So, so yeah, the, the idea is, is that obviously when you're in a cool environment, your body has to generate a little bit more heat uh, to keep warm. You know, you take your temperature, no matter if you walk outside and it's very cold, you take your temperature. So you're still 98.6 mm -hmm. and that has to come from somewhere. So the idea is if, if, life, if you expose yourself to that cooler environment, at some point you reach that so – it's called the thermal neutral point. You reach that point where all the metabolic activities that are normally happening in your body and normally keep you warm as a byproduct, just like your engine stays warm because you're moving the car, at some point it's not enough, and your body actually has a way to ramp up that heat. Its first natural response is to shiver. Yeah. And when you move, the movement of those muscles causes extra calories to be burned, and those extra calories end up creating extra heat, just why you sweat when you exercise. You can think of exercise as sort of a modern-day mimicking of shivering, which is something we've done for, for, for eons. And so the idea is, is that if you continue to do that, you tear down your tissues. So the body has a better response. After a certain period of time, it stops shivering and says, you know what, I'm not going to go through this wasteful step. I'm just going to generate heat directly. And so it actually starts literally at these power plants in every cell, the mitochondria, start generating waste heat just to keep you warm. And, and it turns out you might say, oh, well, who wants to be cold? But, but this happens at about 80 F water, which isn't that bad, and about 60 F air. So at first you might say 80 is, you know, might seem pretty cool. I know people that won't get in their swimming pool if it's, you know, if, if, if it were 80 degrees, but it's really not that bad. You, you know, obviously you live on the coast, so you guys have water that's much colder than this. Similarly with air, 60 doesn't seem warm unless you walked out. If it was minus 20 out and you walked into 60, it would be really balmy. If you yeah. walked in and it was 120, it would feel like an icebox. And so the point yeah. is our body's not good at seeking absolutes. So back to that contrast shower. We constantly go from hot to cold to hot to cold to hot to cold. What we end up doing is vasoconstricting. The, the, the blood vessels all constrict to conserve the heat, and then they dilate when they go to the – when you go to the to the cool, and then they I mean when they go to the warm, and they constrict and they dilate, and they constrict and dilate. And what you end up doing is, is muting your body's response. Your body no longer gets so shocked when it goes from a warm to a cold environment, and you can just stand it a little bit longer. So part of those original experiments I did on my back porch is to sit out there and just wait for my signs of cold. I had never been cold in my life. And what I mean by that, it's not that I hadn't walked outside or been at a football game or been outside cold. I'm saying when you just sit there in shorts until the point where you absolutely can't sit outside anymore yeah. and really understanding what happens with your body. I wasn't in threat of dying. I wasn't going to get hypothermia. But I found that my symptoms 
that really caused me to give up were my fingers, my ears, my toes, my nose. And once I covered those symptoms, I could stay much longer. Mm. So the idea is, is to actually just let that mild cold stress in your life. So think about that cross country trip, you know, your house, the car is the same temperature, the airport's the same temperature, the sure. airplane's the same temperature. But how do you dress differently in the winter and the summer? Mm. Right now, get on a plane, everybody's bundled up. The plane's the same temperature as it was in July. Yeah. So what that ends up doing, you know, it's like your house. Think about it. If you want to burn more energy, if you want to run your utility bill up, it's not about changing the room temperature, which would be equivalent to your body temperature. It's just about cracking the window. You crack the window, now the heater has to run more to keep the room the same temperature. And your utility bill goes up. And so in the of our body, let me just see. That utility me, is food. Let me, um, let me, if you don't mind, say two things. One, just to kind of, because I think it's funny, and the second, to clarify what you just said. Obviously, you didn't have a Jewish mother because if you did, if she was cold, she would be telling you to put on a sweater. So for you sitting out there in your shorts when it was cold, that that wouldn't be something that um, that would have happened to me. But my my understanding is, is so our body is like that heater. And if it's cold, then it has to rise to the occasion. Absolutely. Okay. And in fact, what she would have told you, she would have told you to sit down, shut up, finish your plate. <laughs> yeah, eat. And eat. put your coat on. Right, so eat that, because there's, don't there's move, two. Don't move. Don't ask questions. Right. Eat when you're full and over layer. Absolutely. And we wonder why we're all overweight. Absolutely. You know, when I read that you, I believe you live in Alabama, right? Yes. And I, I read that you're trying to keep your inside temperature to about 50 degrees and you're teaching yourself to sleep without blankets before I really read all the other stuff because I didn't understand the why. And when you read that without knowing the reason, it does sound a little crazy and extreme at first. And I'm thinking to myself, I live in Los Angeles where it's always warm. I keep my heat at 80. I take a hot bath before bed with the heat at 80. Then I go into my heated water bed and I'm like, I'm like the opposite of everything you're saying, you know? Yeah, but it, and and I and you're using the extreme example. So what I said, what what the real example is, is that is that um, I let the house ride more with the outside temperature, and so my house often gets down to sixty or fifty. It doesn't have to be warm all the time. It you know, it, it, and you get used to it because it happens. It happens somewhat slowly. Um, in terms of sleeping without covers. When I was trying to lose weight, and interestingly, at True North, I actually had to stop. So I was losing weight so fast that I actually had to cover up because I was losing weight faster than I really wanted to lose mm. at that point in time. But the point is, is that sleeping out with covers, if you think about it, everyone's taken a nap on the couch. Mm -hmm. Everybody had. Sure. And you sleep perfectly fine laying on the couch. It's not a problem. Right. Yeah. But suddenly, when we go to bed, we need to pull all these covers on. We need the blanket. <laughs> and the question is, why do we blanket? And the reason I, why is because we didn't used to heat bedrooms. Mm. Now we heat bedrooms and we still blanket. Now it feels it, comfortable. Interesting. In fact, astronauts, some of them have to have straps to pull down so they have that weight because that's what makes them sleep well. Some of them like to just float, free float, and 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 just hang out and and float, you know, and and sleep that way. My point is it's just a habit. Right. So when everybody immediately says, you sleep without covers, when they react to that, I'm saying, okay, you're not thinking about this again. That's like this conversation about food and, and social mm -hmm. and people. We, we, if you think about this from a, a basic perspective, you, know, you don't need to have a whole pile of stuff on you to fall asleep. You've adapted yourself to do That's it, and you can unadapt. Now, you can't do it. If you suddenly take your blankets off, you're not going to be able to sleep well, and you right. don't have to jump into a 50-degree room. But what we do know is that we you know, there was a study just this summer from NIH that was released. The guys that these guys had, were sleeping at 66F, uh, and you know they lost an enormous amount of weight. Their metabolism went up. So, so the wow. point I'm making is, is that – you, you gradually do these things. So for me, I started by putting my blanket halfway down, and then I put it farther. Then I did the sheet, but then in the morning, the sheet would be back on me, and the blanket would be back on me. And then <laughs> we slowly do that. To this day, for me, is I, can, I can sleep with that blanket 
just really at the base of the bed, and it really doesn't ever, you know, the comforter. It really, do, I don't have to pull it up. But I can tell you that if you sleep that way, I will guess that you stick your feet out of your blankets. Is that mm-hmm. true? Um, I don't think I do, but I'll ask my husband, but I'll find out. Yeah, if, if because most people that sleep overly warm, the way I can tell you have too many blankets on your bed and that you're mm-hmm. too warm, is you'll stick your feet out. I see. And that's that. actually just the opposite of my cold experiment. What that that's is is you're actually sticking your symptom of mm-hmm. cold, your foot out, to fool your body into believing you're cooler than you really are. That's so interesting. Uh, you know, it's Most funny. People I people can't sleep with socks that use a lot of, of blankets, and the reason why is because once you start doing that, you end up really overheating. And by the, the other side, one of the things that I would do back then especially was wear gloves and socks to bed, which sounds crazy, mm-hmm. but I was trying to have my core exposed. I, I, I wanted as much heat to be able to leave my body as possibly could because, again, all that waste heat is the calories that we're trying to burn. Now, now I'm going to ask you like what you suggest regular people do to try to implement these changes, but before I ask you that – if they're not willing to change their diet and continue eating the standard American diet, these these tweaks, these little experiments aren't going to make that much difference, are they? I'm going to make them look silly, which is kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> like, you about um, you can't out exercise your mouth. You just can't, and you can't. You you, you can't. None of that's going to work. So right. the, the fact of the matter is, is that you can make a lot of changes if you don't have a change in lifestyle and food you probably aren't going to be successful. There are many different ones that work for many different reasons, but all of them all of them end up being a major lifestyle modification if it's going to stay. Right. In terms of this, um I think it actually I am a normal person. I would say society is not normal. I would say that what's socially Hallelujah. extreme Hallelujah. isn't biologically extreme. I agree with you. I completely I love what you just said and I'm going to write that down because at True North one of my mentors Jim Lennon, one of the original people in the NHA, the National uh N- N- Hygiene Association said that he likes to live his life according to the science as opposed to cultural norms and expectations. And I just love what you said. You, me, and Goldhammer were normal. Everyone else is crazy. So thank you. This this was very worthwhile. Well, I but didn't say know. everybody else was crazy. I just simply said oh, okay. uh, I'm normal, but, but what's truly normal is broken. And we know right. that because we're having problems. I was having problems when I lived in a way that was much more aligned with what was socially normed. Exactly. What I'm saying now is that I think what's socially extreme is not necessarily biologically extreme. Humans have spread to every corner of the earth, and one of the reasons why is because they have the ability to adapt to that environment. Just because we can eat it to survive doesn't mean we should eat it to survive. Okay. The same thing goes with the warmth. Just because we can master warmth doesn't mean that it's all good for us. And the same thing goes for light because there's only three inputs to the season. That's where we started this conversation, Mm -hmm. light, temperature, and calorie. That's the only way your body knows what time of the day it is. And I promise you when I went to Australia a couple weeks ago, and I was going to beat this. I I really thought about it. I was going to beat jet lag. Guess what? I lose. I couldn't yeah. get it. It took me two weeks coming back to get everything exactly right again, and my sleep was fine. I'm, and I tried every little trick, and it, I still didn't. I didn't beat my biology. It beat me. So what I'm trying to say is, is that, is that light matters. And right now I'm in a room. After it's dark, it's winter. It's the long photo period, a long, the shortest photo period. That's the time when we would do the most sleeping. Right. And right now I'm awake and I have lights on. Right. So oh, what is that doing to all of my circadian clock? Everything it's messing everything up. I know. And then and, and you know our ancestors they would have to go to sleep when it got dark because otherwise they could be eaten and they didn't have computers keeping them up all night and they weren't playing online poker and they weren't you know uh, you know waking up in the middle of the night when they go to the bathroom to answer their words with friends. So it, we do completely live in an unnatural world and we do seem to seek comfort more than than you know than necessary right so so the idea is is not to give up everything and not to you know only come out on double coupon tuesday that's not the point the point is is to first start realigning a little bit you know 
during those winter nights, you know, for what I suggest people do is, first of all, you know, no lights about an hour before you get to bed. You know, about an hour before. If you're a reader, you can use a little one of those. I use one of those little headlamps. I actually have a red light as well in my bed so that, you know, I, if I'm reading a book, I can use red. I don't do it on screens. I just I don't read on the screen. So about an hour before you go to bed, you start. Mm-hmm. You can also do a contrast shower, and I know this is crazy, but but is, but is, a, is a contrast of, shower is a contrast shower where you go hot cold hot cold hot cold exactly ten okay. seconds of warm twenty seconds of cold and you don't have to go all the way at first eventually you can you repeat that interval you repeat that ten times and then you end on cold and mm-hmm. you just then get out of the shower dry off and go to bed you'll find that you fall asleep pretty quickly because in the night, in the circadian evening, our bodies take serotonin that's produced, and in the pineal gland, that serotonin becomes melatonin. And everybody sort of knows I can take melatonin and go to sleep. I can use melatonin for jet lag. We all know, most people know the word melatonin and, and what it's used for. What most people don't know, though, and what I didn't know, is how does melatonin work? And one of the functions of melatonin is to cause you to dump body heat through your extremities so that your brain can fall down in temperature about a half degree, and that's the process of falling asleep. So part of what you must do to go to sleep is to drop your body temp- your, not your, your brain temperature. Body temperature falls slightly, and, and what we know when we measure people, this, this drop, this thing that's called the, the maximum rate of decline, uh, MROD, of body temperature, that predicts how well you're going to sleep and how long you're going to sleep. And so it turns out that that overheating may, in fact, may, in fact, uh, cause a problem. It, it also, one of the things I was able to learn, you know, I, I'm, I'm generally not a time of day uh, eater. I, I know that you can lose weight eating all the time. It's the idea that we don't lose weight if we eat late at night or if we don't lose weight if we le- eat late at night. I don't really ascribe to that. But one thing I do know is that if you eat late or eat before you go to bed, many people – their body ramps up heat as part of that metabolic process, and that mm-hmm. makes it more difficult for them to get quality sleep. So there is yes. a tie with that and eating late and not getting good quality sleep. So, yes. so what I'm trying to say is, is if you get yourself an environment where you have really good dark for an hour before you go to sleep bed, do a contrast shower maybe 30 minutes after that dark. Do a quick contrast shower. And then get into bed. You'll be shivering a little bit. Brr. Now, of course, your bed might be warm, but you'll be shivering a little bit. But you will find that you fall asleep really quickly, and you don't wake up. So wow. it's it's really interesting. And in your hospital, think about it. Hospitals are always cool because you can't rest when you're warm. Mm. But they always keep them lit. It's like you can't seem to get it. Very, like or prisons. Think about prisons. It's never dark in a prison. How do these people sleep at all? Yeah. Well. <laughs> Prisons and hospitals don't get it all right, I'm sure. You yeah. know, I, I, you know, it's it's they're they're probably not places to emulate. Look at their look if they suit, serve in the cafeteria. I was just gonna say, them. look at the food, the worst food there. So, do you wear with the cold vest that you refer to? It's like a vest where like there's ice, you know, put in yeah, it. Yeah, that's not me though. So but are that, you, that was I, actually I was, just part of that article. Yeah. I was just wondering if you're wearing one or if you have one. No, no, I don't. I don't. That's not what I'm doing. What okay. what I'm doing is just using the natural environment um, that I'm that I'm living in. I'm I basically just cool during the winter, and I don't do it all the time. So, like I said, for most people, it's just swimming. If you go sure. swimming, it's interesting. Swimming is the only sport that you can start at any level of fitness. And it's the only sport that you can do until the end, until the, the very end. It doesn't matter how old you are. That's true. And what I found measuring in my, I've got a, a swim spa and a heat pump so that I can take the temperature all the way down to 45 F. Okay. So oh. if you read, there's actually a link I think you sent out to the Wired article. I took the uh, off of there. We did all kinds of interesting tests, which were, were great. And there's even more information on my blog. I wrote a blog about at some point about his, uh, his experience here where I gave more details that he didn't publish. But but what I found is it looks like the optimal temperature is about 75 F, which is a little bit cooler than a public pool would be. A public pool would normally be around 82 degrees or 84. If it's competitive, it's around 80, 81, and then it's uh, 82 to 84 and 86 if they're going to have infants in it. Just a couple of degrees makes a huge difference 
and the amount of heat that leaves your body. So when we have infants, they want it a little bit warmer because they don't want to, you know, create hypothermia for them. Sure. So the point I'm making is, is that if you find water that's about 75 F, that seems to be the best bang for the buck. And what I mean by that is it's certainly brisk when you get in it, you know it, but at yep. the same time, you get used to it pretty easily. You do. And you you don't... actually do. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say you do. Like sometimes I'm, I'm a real baby about that, but then once you get in, it's fine. Yeah, exactly. And, and you don't have to swim hard. But the really big change that I'll make for everybody is when you get out, don't go get in the sauna. Mm. Don't go do that. Just let your body naturally warm up. And what we found with Stephen when we measured is that when he was running, he was burning all carbohydrate. When he was doing kettlebells, he was burning all carbohydrate. When he was swimming, he was burning all carbohydrate. But when he got out, he shivered for about five to seven minutes, Mm -hmm. and when that shivering period was over, he went down and started burning pure fat. And until we ran the test for, you know, another 20 or 30 minutes, he never came back out of that. Wow. What's really amazing is that when we're cold and our body wants to warm up, it preferentially likes to use fat to do that because it's the most energy-dense fuel. Now, if you're shivering, that's like exercise. Your body is primarily using carbohydrate or glycogen your blood sugar to do that. And this is why people who want to do the ketogenic diet, this is why they get such an advantage by forcing their bodies outside where they take all the carbohydrate away, which is not, I, it's something I did obviously when I was, you know, not eating food, I was on a ketogenic diet at that point. My body had no choice but burn fat. But mm-hmm. you can do this naturally by just simply eating the same foods we eat and have a little bit of molecule stress or have a little bit of a little bit more fasting time in between those meals. Compress those meals and eat them in a smaller window in a day and, and yep. spend more of your time without food. Because when your body is without food or when your body is cool, and that's part of that paper, that's the metabolic winter hypothesis, your yep. body preferentially wants to use that fat and it starts changing at the at the cellular level and starts saying, Hey, I need to survive. I need to I need to grow longer. So, you know, it's, it's really intriguing that those things all intersect and overlap, and it's the one thing we've eradicated. You know, we had sugar 100 years ago. Mm-hmm. We had all kinds of foods 100 years ago, but what we didn't have is light food. We couldn't afford food and warmth all the time. We didn't. Right. right. So our pleasure-seeking mechanisms are actually the reason I think we're in so much trouble, huh? Because we want it, we want to be comfortable, we want to be warm, we want our bellies full. When in fact, doing th- doing these mild stress things, you're saying going less, having a shorter window of feeding, being a little colder than maybe is desirable. These are things that are actually going to help us. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, this is exactly what Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Lyle teach with oh. the pleasure trap. The yep. idea is it it is it. These are socially driven norms, but they're biologically extreme. That's the opposite of what I was saying earlier. I I honestly could listen to you talk all night, which means you have to write a book, please. Now, how do you? Because you're so. Most people tell me to be quiet. So. No, are you kidding? I mean, I, 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 I could listen. I, I'd love to have you back because there's just so much to ask just on each of these papers. But if people want to find out more about you, Ray, uh, where, where will they go? Um, you can just start from the link you had. You can go to my About Me. Just go from About Me, and you can go over there. Just put my name, Ray Cronice, into to, uh, Google, and you'll find lots of different links out there. And and, and Cronice is spelled C-R-O-N. C-R-O-N-I-S-E. Mm-hmm. Right. So I was going to pronounce it incorrectly until you told me. You're you're just probably I you're the most fascinating person I think I've ever talked to. So you have to write. <laughs> Thank you. Or at least lecture somewhere where I can see you or, or start. Well, I just need to come out there because you like to cook and I like to eat. And eating Absolutely. is over when you swallow. And you cook the kind of food I can swallow lots of and not get weight. So, get weight. so that's Absolutely. really a great combination. Whole food, plant-based, uh, no sugar, no oil, no salt. And I actually don't even use nuts and seeds anymore. So the calorie density of everything in this house is 550 calories per pound or less. So we get to eat a lot here and still stay slim. So, Ray, yeah. thank you. So much for uh, for uh, being on healthy living. Uh, you've given us really food for thought and some cold for thought as well. 
And this is Chef AJ. Thank you all so much for listening. If you'd like to find out more about these weekly teleclasses, go to www.eatonprocess.com. And everybody, make sure you get to bed an hour earlier. Start getting a little bit dimmer and do those contrast showers and let us know how that works. Thanks again so much, Ray. It was just such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Good night, everybody.